Our session today will be mod moderated by Ms. Farah Kabir. She is the country director of ActionAid Bangladesh. Ms. Farah Kabir is a prominent figure herself, and she's an active spokesperson for women empowerment and has extensive experience and knowledge in the field of displacement and humanitarian response. We are extremely thrilled to have her present uh, at this session and moderating the discussion. Uh, and with that note, I would like to welcome Ms. Farah Kabir to uh, initiate the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You said all these nights were so that you could pass on the uh, work to me, right, Ruksa? Aww. Okay. Uh, a very warm welcome to everybody. I'm so pleased that uh, you could join us. And, um, you know, uh, this year has taken on, on a very high note around the issues of climate change and uh, the planetary crisis. But uh, uh, from ActionAid and uh, many of you who are here, we have been talking about climate change and how it's impacting the, our lives, the lives of uh, the people we work with, the communities, the frontliners. So, um, you know, climate change on one level doesn't spare everyone, but at the same time, it does affect us disproportionately. And if you are already in a uh, vulnerable position, be it because of your economic status or your social cultural status or your gender, uh, then uh, you know, uh, it impacts you uh, twice or triple in a, on a level. So uh, with these few words, I uh, want uh, us to first uh, share and listen to the uh, research findings that actually need with uh, other colleagues had undertaken. But before I go there, Ruksa, we would like to invite uh, Sanjay to say a few words, right? Because this was a, a partnership with cancer and yes. uh, the study was done uh, uh, in South Asia as well. So uh, back to you, and then let's invite Sanjay to say a few words, and I'll come back again. Sure, thank you, uh, Farapa. So uh, I would like to now invite Ms., uh, Mr. Sanjay Vashisht. He's the Director of Climate uh, Action Network of South Asia. And uh, the study that we would be presenting later on uh, after Sanjay's remarks uh, was in uh, partnership with um, CANSA and uh, the research was actually con conducted with CANSA by ActionAid Bangladesh. So over to you, Sanjay. Thank you so much for joining the session. Um, so please. thank you. Thank you, Ruksar. And thank you, uh, Farapa, for uh, giving me an opportunity. Um, Ruksar, just one clarity. There are two presentations that I'm supposed to make. One to speak on science and other is about regional, which will be in the next panel. Um, should I go ahead with the science or should I make some comments about the partnership first and then? Um, uh, if if I, it's I, okay with you, Sanjay, the partnership first and then we can. Okay. And Perfect. also, thank the, you. Thank you, uh, Barapa. You know, IPCC a little bit on. A little else. bit on. In fact, my, my remarks will be very much um, uh, towards the IPCC also. Um, uh, and and uh, Farapa, I, I, I recall when we started talking about. Climate-induced migration is a phenomenon which is happening on ground in 2015. That was a time when we looked at migration displacement as word in AR5, we couldn't find anything. And we spoke to some of the IPCC scientists. They said there's no correlation between climate change and mi migration or displacement. And that's when we basically informed them, shared with them that, look, we are interacting with communities and this is the phenomena very well visible on the ground. People are suffering. They said, well, we have to um, see how the correlation will be established. So we basically challenged them and we together agreed that, okay, what we will do is we'll do an action oriented research. And our research outcome should be that scientists pick it up and they develop a robust methodology to show correlation between climate change and migration. And today, um, I'm, you know, I think we all are proud as consortium partners that uh, in uh, working group two report, Displacement has been referred 1,800 times, more than 1,800 times, more than seven times in summary for policymakers. That's the achievement of the work that we have been working on. Uh, so partnership has certainly raised the profile of this issue. Uh, many of the colleagues who are working on loss and damage, um, they are actually looking at this phenomena, which is leading towards 
not leading, I would say, which is actually resulting into a humanitarian crisis also, which makes our ongoing development program um, very difficult. And there are more, <clears throat> more um, step back rather than gains uh, to achieve the objectives. So, um, uh, I, and, and I think I, 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 can, and I can say this for many of our cancer members who are in this call, um, more than 85 people have joined. Um, and I think um, uh, uh, certainly we are very proud that one of first objective of moving towards basically acknowledging this as a phenomena, and now this opens the gate for our work on policy is uh, has started. Uh, but of course, the major objective is to make sure that there is social and legal protection for climate migrants, while we all work on uh, adaptation and solutions, and also addressing loss and damage situation on ground. Luxar, you have the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Sanjay. So uh, at this point, I think we will uh, get back to you later after the presentation uh, by Ms. Ms. Sharin Mannan. So I would like to invite uh, Ms. Sharin Mannan, who is the manager of um, resilience and climate justice for, uh, priority of Action Aid Bangladesh. Uh, Ms. Mannan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Rukhsar, Farapa, and obviously Sanjay for setting the stage with the opening remarks. Um, I am going to share a um, quick presentation on the study that we have done uh, together with Kansa. So let me share my uh, screen. Can you use your volume a little bit? Can you increase okay. it? Yes. Is that is that okay now? Better. Yes. Thank you. Better. Okay, I, I hope you all can see my screen, right? Okay, um, uh, my name is Sharin Mannan, and as uh, I have been introduced already, I've been working with Action in Bangladesh on resilience and climate justice. And we thought that uh, post the IPCC working group two report, I think it's extremely important to have a conversation on climate change induced displacement and how we can all collectively uh, work towards um, you know, solving this problem. Um, so let's um, have a quick um, sort of a snapshot on what is the background of climate change induced displacement in Bangladesh. We all can see, I mean, I mean the world is uh, currently witnessing the weather related hazard and how climate change is actually sort of um, intensifying these uh, uh, hazards and which has led to a rise in displacement and migration um, worldwide. But if I can particularly say in South Asia, it is one of the most climate vulnerable countries, uh, regions because of its geography um, and you know um, all the socioeconomic conditions. When it comes to climatic disasters and displacement, um, data shows that in 2017, climatic disasters has triggered most of the displacement in South Asia. And among them, 2.8 million were the new displacement that took place in 2017 in countries like Bangladesh, India, Nepal, and Sri Lanka. Now, when it comes to Bangladesh, uh, particularly uh, in 2019, only because of the flooding that took place and affected um, around 21 districts in Bangladesh, it affected nearly 5 lakh and 80,000 people. And among them, 3 lakh and 700,000 people were displaced. And uh, while this is still uh, on the rise and the IPCC report or any other scientific research have uh, repeatedly been uh, uh, you know, pointing out on climate in this displacement, there is still a lack of enough information on migration and the displacements and the resulting sufferings that people are going through. Now, when it comes to climate induced displacement, actually together with CANSA and other partners have been one of those organizations who have started investigating on this problem since uh, since um, when the um, this topic has actually uh, uh, got attention. So back in 20, 2012, we actually uh, did a study on displacement and migration from climatic hotspots from Bangladesh to actually identify the causes and the consequences of um, this displacement. Um, then that has led, led us to another study in 2016 called Climate Change Knows No Border, which was more on investigating what are the protection gaps, why are, uh, how are these people being treated when they are displaced permanently or seasonally. And then that has led us uh, to a South Asia-wide study that Farapa and Sanja has talked about, which is called the South Asia Migration and Climate Project. And with that, that um, that study has actually investigated um, the impacts of climate displacement in the Silk Route countries, particularly in Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Pakistan. 
and also uh, in other South Asian countries later. So that um, has uh, led these countries to particularly have studies on addressing how to address this climate change in this displacement and what are the policy gaps. So I'm particularly going to be talking about this one. And then based on these studies and uh, recommendations, uh, we have come up with a roadmap for the uh, framework for the um, protection of climate migrants in 2021. Now, this study, as I have already mentioned, this is part of the broader study of South Asia Migration and Climate Project. So what is the objective of the study? Um, Let's start with a brief background of what, what is the philosophy that actually it believes in. Now we work, the main philosophy of our work is human rights-based approach. And we think that through a human rights-based approach, displacement and forced migration can be avoided by building absorptive, uh, adaptive and transformative capacity of the people, the society, the institutions and the environment altogether. And hence with that um, sort of flavor and philosophy, we have um, done this study mostly to deepen the understanding of the challenges associated with climate change displacement faced by the communities, and also to identify the people-centric solutions that can address these um, displacement and migration issues, um, uh, obviously by upholding the human rights of these people. So to um, actually fulfill these objectives, we uh, had two step um, investigations. First was the first one was a participatory assessment of disaster impact and mig on the migrant families, and also a review of the key policies and uh, development plans that um, has the potential of dealing uh, with disaster and climate induced migration and displacement. The study area we deliberately selected to uh, total five areas. Among them, the three were the climate hotspots or the climate um, vulnerable areas. One was the Sunamganj district um, in uh, the, in the Silat region, which is a flash flood prone area. Then there was Kulna, which is a coastal city, which is obviously cyclone and storm surge prone, and then Naga, which is a drought prone area. And then we also had Chittagong and Dhaka, which are the main top two prioritized areas as destinations uh, for migrants to uh, ultimately migrate to. Now, uh, let us see how uh, South Asia is actually impacted by this disaster and climate change induced um, in this displacement. So the according to the report of the internal displacement, um, the, the global report of 20, 20, 2018 and 2020, we can see a comparative picture of the South Asian countries, the comparison between displacement due to conflict versus displacement due to disasters. You can see in countries like India, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, the ratio of the uh, displacements triggered by disasters versus uh, climate uh, versus conflict is extremely high. And within just two years, 2017 to 2019, you can see how staggeringly the, um, the, the uh, ratios has increased for disasters in this climate change. Now, what are the drivers of climate change induced displacement? We all know that there is still um, not there is still no consensus on how climate change exactly um, sort of influences or triggers displacement. Whether that is attributed to climate change, how much of that is attributed to climate change? Now, uh, this study has um, concluded in such a way that climate change might not be the primary factor of displacement or migration in many cases, but it definitely ha has it heavily influences the migration decision of people. So you can see the diagram of the, how climate change actually influences the drivers of um, displacement. What are the drivers actually? We, can, um, we have identified that basically there are five kinds of drivers, environmental, social, economic, demographic, and political. And climate change stresses and uh, shocks have um, influence on all of these drivers. For example, if um, an area, say for example, a coastal district in Shatkia, which is extremely prone to cyclones and storm surges, the areas are hit by, have been hit by a series of cyclones like Cedar, Isla, Moshen, and, and so on. So these have actually um, led people to lose their livelihoods, to lose their income and well-being, and that falls under the economic driver for them to actually um, uh, decide to migrate to um, some places. Um, it has led to the the higher exposure of people to and to the hazards and it has led uh, declining eco ecosystem based services like 
water security, food security, energy security. So these are the environmental drivers. And when it comes to social, people have lost their access to um, education or healthcare services. That has again uh, led to take them the decision of migration. Politically, same, these, um, um, these stresses and uh, disasters have led to conflicts, issues related to poor governance and insecurities. And also in the demographic by the disease prevalence, you know, the population density and, you know, the ratio of the area to live in. So you can see the climate change has the influence on all these factors or drivers that has ultimately led people to decide to, uh, you know, either permanently or seasonally migrate. These are the field findings. What we have tried to do is we uh, try to sort of map on how the life of a person or, or a vulnerable person, be it a woman or a man or a young people, actually revolves around this migration decision making. So uh, the, one of the interesting findings is that in most of the areas, riverbank erosion, which is triggered by intense cyclones and storm surges and tidal surges, was one of those reasons for one of the main reasons for people to actually get displaced from one place to another. And another one was definitely the loss of livelihood. As a result, people actually got trapped being displaced from one place to another because initially they tried to um, uh, relocate in the nearby places, but then they have to ultimately take the decision to go in, in other cities. Um, when they actually lose their crops, do lose their livelihoods to such disasters, then they actually lose their income. And to actually run their households, they actually take loans from the informal sectors, and then they uh, get involved into this vicious cycle of debt. And by you know, uh, due to not being able to pay these debts, many people have also migrated uh, seasonally or permanently to other regions. Post-disaster reliefs and resettlement plans that the government have been taking has, has been largely unsuccessful and they have, that has failed to reach vast population and that has also triggered them to actually migrate. Um, lack of information system was one of the key points identified by the by the participants like uh, if they were being uh, served with uh, you know right and updated information on where to go how to migrate what to do then they would have taken a conscious decision for a planned migration access or you know lack of diversified skills have also challenged them particularly women to actually migrate because they don't have other skills to live on or to survive in the, their area of origin so they actually migrated in search of livelihood to other places now, what, where do they go actually when they migrate? So there was a very interesting finding that due to lack of infrastructure and facilities, cities like Kulna, Shunamganj, or Noga, these small cities are not very popular uh, for people for a long-term migration. Rather, they, um, they go or plan to go to Dhaka or Chittagong, like these big cities, because they lack the infrastructure, the education, the health care, and the livelihood facilities. Um, when these families or my people actually migrate from one place to another, they also get forced to, re you know, relocate due to development interventions as well, and then adds another layer of vulnerability to their life. And finally, after migration, when they go to another area, there is a serious lack of receival of local government services, say, for example, the social safety net programs, because due to the issue of the national identity, having or not having the NID cards or all that actually make them very difficult, make them very difficult for them to actually access those services. Um, and then again, in the urban spaces, there is always the fear of eviction, the fear of conflict with the, you know, the current group. So that also make them vulnerable in the urban areas when they migrate. And with uh, these continuous environmental challenges, there is also lack of basic services like the wash services or the you know, education services, the life skill services that also make them, um, you know, uh, them, put them in a volatile situation. And finally, the uncertainty of work, they all mostly go to um, other places and migrate in search of work, but they don't really know what to look for and how to get involved. So that also lead to, uh, that doesn't also guarantee, uh, give them any guarantee of work in the destination. So what have been, we all know that women and children actually are one of the most sufferers of, of uh, you know, the impacts of climate change. What actually uh, this displacement or migration mean to them? Mostly we have seen in, in, in South Asian countries, like mostly the male members of a family actually migrants. And then the women are triply burdened with the, you know, household services, the, 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 um, their, their, um, 
burdened with the livelihood skills and also they have to take care of their children and elderly. Um, in, in, again, in few cases when their, their male counterparts actually migrate, they have there are cases when they are faced with sexual and mental harassment uh, within their household or maybe in the shelters. And that has also uh, taken a, a, a big toll on them. Children actually faces a, a, a big trauma during the process of migration because they see in front of their eyes, their houses getting demolished, their, you know, but their closed ones are, you know, dying or, you know, starving. So that leads a big trauma on their life as well. But there were interesting cases when we have found a few young women that have also reported that migrating to a town was a good thing for them as they now enjoy freedom and manage to pay their debts back home. So there were, you know, positive cases as well. We also try to capture a few case stories of the person so that we can actually feel, you know, what they actually go through. So this is the story of Yasmin Begum, who was um, who was an inhabitant of Shunamganj district of Silet region, which is a flash flood prone area. So she and her entire family actually migrated to Dhaka because uh, in the flash flood prone area, they actually, they don't have anything to do in the six months because they, they, they go underwater. So in search of work, they have migrated to Dhaka. But even though they have, uh, they are now managing uh, their life, they have uh, some sort of work. But as she said that the city has saved me but from starvation, but not never gave the peace because she don't feel the social tie, the connections, the bondings there. So the, she is ultimately not happy there. But there are also cases of resilience where women have to get upon themselves to actually protect themselves and, and the community. Like Joanti Bisha, she is from Paikacha Upazila Kulna, and which is an, an extremely cyclone prone uh, area. And also there are cases of riverbank erosion. So she and her family has lost their land to river at least six to seven times. And currently they are living in a volatile squatter. And that, that, that is also being uh, going inwards due to riverbank erosion. But now that she has been living here for a while, she has realized that she had to deal with it. So I have tried to um, advocate with the local chairman, the un union Porishad, the MPs, but, and sort of um, made them realize that if they can, you know, um, have the river dredged, then um, that their part of the la land can be uh, can be saved. And she's trying, and will continue this advocacy to save her community and herself. We have also tried to have a look into the policies and the development plans that are related or have talked about climate change and climate induced migration. So I have um, uh, put the very important uh, ones here, starting with the National Adaptation Program of Action, which was taken in 2005, which identifies the adverse impacts of climate change uh, <clears throat> linked to climate displacement and among the projects that they have lined up they have very direct um, they, have, they have two projects which directly addresses the issue of migration then we had the bangladesh climate change strategy and action plan back in 2009 which was sort of an update uh, or or a revised or more programmatic version of the NAPA that recognizes environmental refugees, but that also talks about the development of the monitoring mechanism for internal external migration, um, the de development of a protocol to provide adequate support for the resettlement and the rehabilitation facilities. When it comes to development plan, we have reviewed the seventh five-year uh, plan, which um, also, again, give importance to climate change and environment and all that issues. And they have emphasized particularly on integrated river management plan to actually reduce the number of climate change induced migration. And also they have um, emphasized on the establishment of a comprehensive evidence base. Since uh, lack of skill um, is a very important challenge that um, these migrants actually face. So this plan has also highlighted on the improvement of the technical and vocational education system. Now, uh, the Bangladesh Delta plan, which is, uh, you know, the long term plan, and it, it also provides future projections on what can, what could have can be um, the picture of climate displacement in the years and it has uh, given projections for uh, 2031 till 2051 and how the number of um, climate migrants will exponentially increase. You can see in the graph that how the people uh, are migrating over the years from coastal from the drought prone areas and how there is a staggering increase of climate migrants in the urban areas. 
the very latest eight five-year plan has actually taken a different aspect and it, it has talked about improving the design of the cities to make them climate friendly and the integration of effective systems for housing uh, for the new population job opportunities and all that COVID-19, when we were uh, conducting this study in 2020, uh, 2019, 2020, COVID happened all of a sudden and the migration took a very interesting turn when, when these climate migrants people, um, uh, when they, who came to urban places, had to return back to their, their homelands because they actually lost their jobs or these lockdowns and all these. And in between, in 2020, there were a series of um, you know, floods and the super cyclone Amphan that took place in Bangladesh and India, which actually sort of made these population even more vulnerable, both um, when they were in the destination and also uh, when they came back to their homeland. And as a result, when as they don't have any work, both in urban and their home villages, they had to took loans from the informal settlements, uh, from the informal sector at the very high interest rate, which actually, again, um, increase their burdens. And many people who actually also were planning to actually migrate for agro-based or non-agro-based um, sort of um, occupation, they actually also got trapped into the situation. So that took a very interesting um, turn when it comes to migration. Now, the study has actually come up with a few solutions for both short-term and long-term. And we tried to focus more on the you know people-centric approaches, what the people actually wanted. So. One of the main um, sort of uh, asks from these uh, people were to ensure their basic rights and services, because if they are provided with their ensured right, rights and services, while they sort of make the decisions to migrate, this may help them to actually do not take the decision of migration if they are given with the rights or rights and services. Community-led protection system is also another important area, particularly if we can engage women and young people in the protection and the emergency, emergency response mechanism that can come really handy for the community to know themselves and act. Effective investment in disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation was one of the important areas. Also establishing the multi-purpose information center, which was really emphasized for the community so that if they have to migrate, uh, you know, in any case, they, uh, they are at least prepared to take the conscious decision of planned migration. Skill development and employment generation at the local level was also extremely important. And also introduction of the universal social protection system, unlike the social safety nets only, so that they have them themselves or their families protected. And also there was an interesting point that if these people can be given with a special identity cards, these displaced people, so that it, it is easier for them to actually access these services. In the long term, definitely development of climate risk and resilience index, which, which was also supported by the projections in the Bangladesh Delta plan, development of a national displacement and migration policy. Now, when this study was um, being taken, um, there was um, the, the, the national strategy was being formulated. We know we, we know that the re revised version is now, um, you know, ready. Uh, policy review and alignment was also an important long term action and finally establishing a financial architecture for climate response. So these were the recommendations from the study. Thank you from my end. I have given the link of the study in, in, the, in the slides. If you wish to um, have a read, please feel free to um, you know, uh, visit the site. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you so much, Sharin. Uh, excellent presentation. And I think the uh, findings uh, have left us with a lot of food for thought. And, I, I, so much time was spent uh, over the years in debating whether it is climate induced or migration or not. But end of the day, those who are in the front line or who have to migrate, they could feel the and they experience the intensity of such action and such decisions. And they didn't come uh, easy, but they had to make them. Well, uh, while we are pleased that uh, it is being recognized and there's more conversation uh, taking place, there's still a lot of work to be done. And definitely uh, in the recommendation section, you talked about what was the people's ask and what the policies are. Well, we uh, are uh, a long way from 
providing for the slums and informal settlements. And that's exactly where a lot of the people who are migrating end up. So uh, there's much to be done there. And then uh, in our policy, in our investments, in our budgets, we have to bring this in. But before I uh, get into a longer discussion, I want to bring in Sanjay. And Sanjay, in South Asia, uh, how, how are we dealing with this climate-induced migration? And what are the challenges from your perspective or from where you're working in cancer and so on? So Sanjay, some thoughts from you. G, G Farapa, um, thank you, uh, Shireen. Thanks for uh, you know, presenting the situation on ground. Um, si situation on ground is not very, very um, you know, optimistic. And I think this develop all civil societies and NGOs with policymakers need to uh, work to make sure that we provide a very adequate response um, that ensures a decent life, uh, dignified life uh, for people who are impacted. Uh, what kind of uh, challenges are there? First, migration is not on the list as a phenomena uh, to the policymakers. They don't see that as a phenomena because of climate change. Um, we have interacted with some of the governments. They say there's no data that exists. Of course, those responses was before IPCC report was out. So now they may have changed their opinion, not sure, but we, we need to check. So migration is not a phenomena. And if you do not acknowledge a problem, you do not work towards a solution. Unfortunately, that, that's the um, um, attitude uh, here. Migration, but if I was to ask you, Sanjay, that uh, people or policymakers acknowledge economic migration, right? They do acknowledge. So there are push and pull factors, uh, Farapa. So we are talking about push factors here. Pull factors are basically for better opportunities. You basically try, you climb in the on the economic ladder up and uh, uh, basically go for a, a better jobs and uh, earn money. In fact, migration is, has been happening. In that case, migration has been happening for ages. In fact, migration uh, push factor has also been happening, but we have been addressing it uh, to, a, to a larger extent uh, through, for example, if there is a, um, if there is a natural, uh, no, not natural, environmental disaster, or there is a relocation because of some, some infrastructure is being uh, prepared. Uh, in India, uh, many of the dam uh, reservoir has forced many people migra migrate or relocated, I would say, to other places. And of course, there has been a compensation process also, how they will be compensated with land and money and how the efforts will be made to rehabilitate them. But I'm referring to environmental degradation, which is forcing people out of their home. And uh, that's the push factor that we are referring to. And this is, the, it, it is, this is how we have I, segregated the migration phenomena into two to make sure that we address the right, uh, uh, mig right kind of migration, which is caused because of loss of livelihood, loss of life, lives, and that is because of frequent extreme as well as slow onset disaster that's going on. So migration is uh, also seen as intrusion in, in, uh, in South Asian countries. We don't like people migrating to my cities and snatching opportunities, job opportunities. In fact, it is a global phenomenon for sure. This, these are the sentiments which are, which are there uh, globally. But within South Asia, it is very strong. We have seen many, many political parties also uh, you know, mobilizing uh, their, uh, you know, vote banks around this politics, unfortunately. And that's where those who are uh, forced mig migrated, uh, they suffer a lot. Um, there is no clarity on push and pull factors. That's the other problem um, of, of uh, within South Asia. Uh, how do we differentiate? Um, what kind of response we need to prepare? In fact, uh, what we have also seen recently um, is that uh, uh, how do we uh, uh, compensate them uh, when they when they migrate? Uh, Shirin mentioned about source. She mentioned about destination. Yes, moving to cities is a good idea that act as a destination. But unfortunately, um, within cities, they go to a very um, uh, uncharted territory. They don't know what kind of uh, you know uh, impact will be there. What kind of challenges they may face? Um, and and in fact, within cities, the climate impact is so much that. The, their number of earning days goes down. Uh, and, and that means they've spent a lot of money in recovering from those diseases, uh, which are uh, uh, because of heat island process or because of um, you know, humid conditions, et cetera. So, so people are really, uh, you know, they face do double kind of uh, challenges here. What needs to be done? Certainly, uh, you know, there is a regional framework that uh, Kansa Action Aid we have proposed. And I'll, I'll just present that. Uh, one, acknowledge and recognize that climate change is triggering displacement and fueling distress migration. 
it need to be recognized once you recognize, diagnose the problem then the treatment can start whether you need a first aid or you need a long term solution uh, to increase the immunity so uh, first aid could be at destination how their rights are secured how they, their their food security is secured how their livelihood security is secured and the uh, at, at the source that's a long term how they 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 are they are, uh, they basically they are ensured sustainable livelihoods for long term the rural in rural areas livelihoods uh, uh, diversified livelihood opportunities are created then urgently act to address um, there, there is a uh, regional uh, instability risk because of migration uh, within south asia um, the, uh, there is a human rights uh, uh, human, human humanitarian crisis uh, situation that exists uh, if you see climate change we started working on environment then we saw um, uh, development being threatened because of uh, climate change as an added burden and now humanitarian crisis is is, is coming up uh, human dignity uh, compromise a lot people who migrate from one place to another they do not uh, they migrate in very hostile conditions people hate them uh, they of course they are, they are cheap labor they enjoy that kind of cheap labor uh, but then uh, they don't like them and we saw this why uh, you know this kind of feeling when due to covid lockdown people the, the, same those people who has built these cities and who has been supporting they were forced to go back to their homes and nobody you know supported them during lockdown uh, they stopped getting their salaries and all that so certainly so um, you have another 30 seconds okay so i'll i'll be very quick so certainly i think we need to protect human rights um, that will ensure um, uh, avoid exploitation that will ensure uh, ensure that human rights um, are protected uh, and right to life, liberty and uh, personal security, social security and adequate living standard. These are some principles that we need to uh, protect and ensure at the uh, at the destination. And most important, and I'll, I'll then I'll stop. There are others also. Uh, one, national action plans and national determined contributions should take into account migration as a phenomenon. How many people a country will will ensure are not do not migrate in next eight years? By 2030, I think that's the commitment that government should be making, not not to the uh, world but to itself also. And unfortunately, uh, NAP and NDCs are more inward looking; they are not regional in nature. They, I mean, I, I would like to see a South Asian chapter in every national action plan and NDCs where countries connect with each other. Absolutely. And, and we are missing regional platform. I'll stop here. Thank you, uh, Sanjay. Uh, I'm going to now invite uh, Anandita Ridita. She's the Senior Manager Operations Climate uh, Bridge Fund. Are you with us? Do we have Anandita? Yes, Appa, can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. And Does please keep to five minutes. Okay. I will try that. Shari Napa, wonderful presentation, very informative. Can't wait to read the whole report. And Farapa, unfortunately, I'm facing internet connection trouble. So if you allow me, then I would like to continue with my video off. Of course. Um, uh, at some point, we must all put our videos on and take a photo. But yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. So I will briefly share our experience from Climate Bridge Fund and we'll try to focus on some of the issues that we think are really important to talk about in dealing with climate induced migration effectively in Bangladesh. But before I start, I will give a very brief background of Climate Bridge Fund for those who do not know who we are and what we are doing. So it's basically a trust fund established by BRAC with support from the government of Germany through KFW. And we are basically trying to support the climate migrants or people who are at the risk of being displaced due to climate change impacts in five cities, including Borishal, Rajshahi, Khulna, Shatkira, and Shirajgans. And last year, we, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we established another window named emergency response. Through this window, we tried to expand our coverage by targeting climate migrants whose lives and livelihoods are being affected due to the pandemic throughout Bangladesh. So we follow a bottom-up approach and people-centric approach. So it's mandatory for our applicant organizations to consult the communities and local authorities to identify the problems and solutions. So we go to the fields frequently also during our due diligence project monitoring and consult the communities. In the process, we try to make sure that the real needs of the fields are well addressed through our projects. 
And we also try to focus that duplication can be avoided in the process. And our experience says that it's very important for funding entities to know the field, be aware of the context, to understand the priorities of the climate migrants. So most of the climate migrants we talked with mentioned about diverse needs as they walk into more uncertainties the moment they reach to the city slums. And among the needs, the need for better housing, if not permanent, and sustainable livelihood were very common. But most of the project uh, proposals that we receive focus on softwares like trainings, different skill de uh, developments, awareness sessions, like regular development projects or the solutions those have been you know, provided for years. For example, the field findings that Shari Napa presented give us a clear idea about the needs and the scopes of the intervention that's required in the field right now. So those are the areas that the project proposal should be focused on. And another important issue that um, there is um, that our experience tells us that there's a huge gap of climate financing at the local level. We reviewed around um, 200 project ideas in last two years and realized that there is a gap in conceptual clarity about adaptation and also in technical capacity that's required for designing adaptation projects. The local knowledge is there, as Shari Napa also presented, and the organizations working in the field have also the success stories there, but we don't see the reflection of that in the submitted concepts or the proposals. So that is another main reason for local organization for not being able to access climate financing through competitive process. So to address that gap, we are trying um, through our calls, we are trying to capacitating the local organization. We are trying to give them different sessions and make them aware of this process, trying to build their capacity. But we still feel that we can do more. And it's very important for them to understand the context and differentiate between regular development project from adaptation project. So APA, yes, uh, briefly, that's our experience where we feel that the local organization should be more capacitated in understanding the differences and then designing effective project proposals. Thank you, Anandita. Uh, uh, you actually saved some time, but uh, uh, I'll come back to some of what you've raised. But I want to move on to Zareen now uh, and ask her about um, how NAP, National Adaptation Plan, is, uh, you know, the process is going on and recently there was all the meetings. So how did it incorporate the issue of climate-induced migration? And, um, of course, my favorite thing is young people's consultation. So were young people involved in these consultations? So two questions for you. I mean, uh, and not the tokenism, the real consultation. Thank you so much, Parapa, for giving me the floor. So uh, I've been uh, involved in the NAP formulation process for a, a long time. I was involved uh, from the beginning. So um, during the consultations, we were actually uh, pleased to see that people are aware of this issue uh, better than before. Because earlier, uh, people were not actually uh, were concerned about this issue, and this was uh, almost a new thing, especially for the policymakers. But uh, as we started our consultations uh, in 2021, uh, so we we thought that uh, the scenario has uh, changed in in a positive way. I think. Uh, these organizations who have been doing this research uh, activities over the past few years has a very uh, positive impact in, in this regard because uh, this, uh, these uh, findings have made them more aware of this uh, new issue and uh, made them uh, uh, made them to think uh, about this. So in, in the consultations, especially in the, in the local areas, we had some um, discussions on uh, migration and displacement, and especially uh, the issues were like um, loss of assets and livelihood, especially in the coastal areas and the river, uh, river erosion prone areas, because in those areas, uh, people um, have uh, lack of livelihood opportunities, which mostly make them to migrate in new areas. Also, uh, food security was another issue that uh, was highlighted during the consultations. So um, uh, still we are having some reviews and uh, 
we are getting feedbacks from different uh, stakeholders regarding these issues. Uh, yet, I would say that uh, this is not a, a very mainstream issues uh, like the other issues, but it, it's a good sign that we are talking about it. And I'm very hopeful that in the future consultations, we will we would be able to highlight this issue even more. And uh, thank you for sharing the findings of uh, the, the two studies that we have seen today. So I, I, I would be glad to incorporate these findings into our um, documents as well. Thank you so much. And to the second question, uh, yes, we did um, uh, some consultations with the young people, especially uh, in the coastal area and the hill tracks. We, uh, we, uh, we uh, discussed with the enthusiastic youths about this issue and uh, get, um, but, uh, the thing is that in the coastal area, youths were more aware of climate change related uh, impacts and uh, they were more concerned. I think this is because of uh, the, the extended works of different NGOs and development organizations. But in the hill tracks, uh, we found that this awareness is a bit, bit low, but uh, we are hopeful that if we can um, capacitate the youths even more and, and enhance their knowledge on climate change issues, they, they would be more uh, aware of this. And uh, still uh, now we are including the youths in our consultations in the both the nationals and the uh, local levels. And uh, we also are planning to in include youths in our future um, workshops. So uh, we are very hopeful that we would be able to incorporate um, feedbacks from all the different stakeholders regarding the gender, age, and um, ethnicity. So uh, we are trying to make this document as much as participatory as we can, and we are really uh, grateful that everyone is um, uh, participating willingly and uh, giving the, us their feedbacks. And we hope that uh, everyone who has joined um, uh, today's uh, session would uh, would um, give us uh, positive or and negative both feedbacks uh, regarding this document and help us make this a more inclusive. You want constructive effective. feedback. All exactly, right. of course, yes. constructive feedbacks. We would love to uh, have those. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you, Jareen. Uh, I want to now go to move from the Bangladesh to the South Asia level. Uh, Sheila Patel is the founder and current chairperson of Some Dwellers International. Sheila, how networks like SDI are working for climate migrants and what sort of support do grassroots organization needs? Over to you. So Farah, thank you so much. I am just riveted and fascinated with the reports that you have produced and please send them all to me. I must first of all say that it's only three years that our global network has begun to look at the intersections between development investment deficits and climate change. And the interesting thing is that when we look back on every single data collection that we have done on people who are now living informally in cities, 90% of the core cause of them coming into the city is some climate related directly or conflict that is related to water or some uh, asset that produces this, which is climate link. So, so the first thing I want to say is that while every single episode of large groups has this connection, this has never been made. And so when, you, when I heard about the, the IPCC talking about displacement for the first time. It's like research has to uh, scientifically, through their own mechanisms, uh, acknowledge what is real. Only then it becomes the truth. And it's something that we have to work more closely together to change because we don't have a time band to do this long investigation before people's crises are thought about. The second thing I want to say is that our work lies in the fact that cities and urban areas absolutely love the cheap labor that comes, but have no interest politically in terms of governance or in terms of just human kindness to provide any amenities and services. And what you're seeing today are four generations of people who have been uh, locked into increasingly dense informal settlements because the space in which they can live and work informally don't grow. 
The next thing I want to say is that our global network seeks to find solutions that emerge anecdotally or locally and make them into multiple multipliable aggregated solutions that then have that force governments to take them up and i can give a lot of examples but we don't have that much time but what we are trying to say is that the challenges that women face when they are forced to come into cities or cope with their families where the heads of households are outside is just completely invisible it is not docu i mean we do vignettes like the the, the write ups that you've put together but the sheer volume of that is never discussed on this the whole city planning is such a colonial instrument we i want you all who are talking about displacement and uh, migration to cities to look at statutory planning of urban areas and how colonially victorian it is in south asia it is a statutory thing people can go to the court with it but the very instrument refuses to look at what are the deficits in informal settlements the other very important thing is everybody wants to work in medium and small towns your data shows that poor people can get at least food to eat twice a day and a job in urban areas that are large primary cities and no ngos no government institutions no global organizations want to work in the primary cities nobody wants to work in a full fledged way in mumbai dhaka kolkata um, kathmandu because these are these are places which are full of elite capture they don't want to talk about informality or entitlements and that's a very big social justice issue which we have to club with migration and the last point i want to say is that covid like you said showed that there are not only people who come and live in the city you have circular migrants who come and go from cities on a on a back and front face who don't have an address who don't have identity have no form of protection and absolutely no support structure and this is happening globally the other very important thing which i didn't hear you say but i hope will come out in your discussions is that most of the large wars are related to energy water and they are crushing poor people and poor people are no longer going to refugee camps because of all the challenges that we know occur in terms of violence in terms of all kinds of things and more and more people are crossing borders at their own cost into the neighboring country and going into the invisibility of informal settlements i can tell you every single settlement in india that has people from other south asian countries who have no identity no mechan mechanism to get any recording about this so i'll stop here but all your discussions about migration please include me we are very deeply committed to it we are doing lots of interesting things they were never thought of as climate related but they are and so we can bring that knowledge about urban informality into these discussions and learn a lot from all of you so thank oh, you we much. need to we need to we definitely need to do put our collective uh, uh, energy behind this i'm going to invite manuel now who's the global head of migration environment and climate change division of iom so how is iom planning to invest in tackling climate change induced displacement a very simple question for manuel a very simple question up and not maybe maybe not so simple um i think I, i i like very much of what was said here i think there is also a work in progress especially on southeast asia uh, these temporal temporal spatial geographical distribution of displacement and migration are very important and the numbers are per times quite uh, confusing right uh, in southeast asia the existence of infrastructure to evacuate people in times of distress 
any times of very significant hazards constitutes displacement. But much of this displacement is temporal, right? People go to the evacuation shelters and then they return back. Those numbers are being counted uh, as new displacement. And so they also have a negative effect, not allowing us to compartmentalize a bit what is the post-displacement situation of individuals to identify the best choices. Part of the work that IOM does is this. Uh, of course, uh, nowadays is different, but has always been within the displacement management. And Bangladesh is one of the first countries in the world that has a, a humanitarian, in, inside humanitarian architecture, a displacement cluster. The majority of the other the countries use the designation, which is the formal designation of camp management and camp coordination, what is usually known as CCCM. And this CCCM is the machine that addresses displacement um, after disaster. But there's a lot of work that IOM has done in the past 20 years on transmitting these discussions on capacity to manage displacement prior to disaster. So working with governments and looking at the infrastructure to evacuate people, looking at capacity to manage these areas where people will be temporarily, what assistance do they need, and also reflect on what are the needs of these individuals so that their displacement could end and they could go home. If we don't do this comprehensive approach, we will always end in situations where people are displaced, they want to go back home and they don't have that capacity or those resources, and they are forced into secondary displacement into cities. And there are the ones, of course, that are also directly displaced into large urban centers. So. IOM's work globally functions within this architecture, but we are responsible in part for the global compact of migration that looks at the formalization of migration and migration pathways. The objective number two of the global compact is addressing the drivers of migration, adverse, uh, addressing the adverse drivers of migration for which climate change is one of them. So working on forms to allow people to make better, more informed decisions on migration or helping them stay where they are. The right to stay is a fundamental thing that we need to continue to discuss. And on the other side, on objective five, look at migration pathways and how can governments and communities enable migration as adaptation or migration as a strategy in a safe, a dignified way, and that people are not at risk. Much of these will continue to be inside countries, rural to urban, and some geographical distribution of this migration. There is then some group of people that does international migration, which is much more regulated, but we are very concerned in many of the aspects that were said here, how urbanization, population growth, uh, these large numbers of mobility into cities will themselves be affected by disasters when large changes on hydrology in these new cities, in these peripheries, uh, will create floodings, landslides, and other catastrophic situations. So this is a bit of what IOM does in the realm between sustainable development and emergency operation across this spectrum impacted by climate change, but capacity of governments to have these response mechanisms and digest many of the points our colleagues said is fundamental. Displacement and migration, especially uh, triggered or augmented by climate change is a governance problem, in our opinion, is a problem of capacity to protect and ensure the rights uh, to citizens of those countries. And we all need to work with governments across the regions and across the world to build uh, processes, structures, make resources available and work pro aversion and mitigation of forced displacement and better choices of human mobility. Thank you. I think I saved a few minutes because I just just before you uh, just a quick question. So does IOM also uh, have messaging and others because migration is not going to stop. So uh, uh, and and does uh, do you think in future there's opportunity to look at the labor aspect of it? You know because a lot of us are saying that it's free labor and very welcome by political actors or by the private sector. So. 
it's a I, quick I, reflection. Yeah, no, messaging, of course. Look, it's very important. I, I agree with some of the colleagues. The IPCC report, working group two, the, the most recent one, a couple of weeks ago, because it included geographers and people that know about migration is a tremendous evolution on the acceptance of migration and climate change, this interface and the impacts. And so I predict that over the course of this year, all the way up to the COP, human mobility, to be a bit more friendly term, that includes formal migration and displacement, will continue to grow an interest. I just did yesterday here at the MENA Climate Week an event with UNFCC on water scarcity, sustainable development, and human mobility that is looking at these dimensions. And the message is very clear. People will be moving. If we do not allow them to stay where they want, when they want, or we don't allow them to have the mechanisms to move safely, it will be a tragedy. And I think that's the most important message and the message that we need to have a lot of politicians understand this. Not everything needs to be negative. This is not about stopping people from moving, is enabling choice. The choice on human mobility is a right of individuals and they should choose to stay or to go. And if they go, they need to do so in a safe and in a dignified way. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. And I'm going to move to our next speaker because we're really um, pressed for time. Uh, uh, Shireen Lira, she is from the Embassy of Switzerland. She looks after, she's the manager, program manager for governance, climate change and environment. So over to you, Shireen. How is the Embassy of Switzerland supporting the internally displaced people? So, okay. Can you hear me, Abbas? Good evening, everyone, and thank you for APA for uh, inviting me and uh, uh, for in today's discussion, which is very, I mean, I have a strong interest on uh, climate induced migration, and uh, I feel very, uh, like, I feel very happy that at the, this discussion is taking place in this international conference. Um, I've been participating in the Gabeshian conference for last few years, so this time uh, because of the virtual platform. Uh, I, I feel privileged to participate this uh, event. And uh, this, there's a, I don't know how much time, do you, five minutes or like- You now have about four minutes. If four minutes. One okay, minute after five minutes. I don't want to waste time. Um, it's uh, uh, as everyone was talking about the issues around this climate induced migration. Um, I mean, uh, from the Embassy of Switzerland, uh, we are very active in the domain of migration. General, it's uh, in general migration um, uh, to be. Uh, um, we lost you for a couple of seconds. Uh, uh, sorry, it's just I had a call and then I got disconnected. So can you hear me, Appa? Yes. Hello. Yeah. So we, uh, what I was telling, like we are very active in the uh, migration domain. Uh, we have a strong footprint, but in the climate induced migration, we do not have that strong uh, intervention yet, but uh, from the embassy side, what I would say that uh, uh, we are uh, going to uh, look into the climate induced migration, uh, part of our um, global priority and our country priority. So uh, Switzerland has an international commitment to actually to allocate minimum 30% of its uh, overseas development aid for uh, climate change. and. Uh, uh, as uh, our the Swiss uh, practice, it's uh, we will build on the strength that we have, the area that we have been working. So definitely the migration as we have a strong position in the migration field in Bangladesh, climate induced migration will be one of the area that we will be looking into in coming days. And uh, uh, overall in climate change, uh, we, we are also uh, maintaining kind of uh, integrating climate change in our overall program. And uh, 
hopefully by within the next year or, or within 2024 we'll be um, we will be able to say that okay how much we are investing on uh, climate change and uh, where do we have like climate migration program uh, but as it was a very fascinating discussion I was um, uh, I mean uh, to hear from all the panelists uh, in my previous capacity with the FCDO program where I was uh, looking up to the climate induced migration program so I was like uh, very very keen on the all the discussion and just for um i was like in bangladesh we have uh, in my previous program we just supported the national strategy on disaster and climate induced migration which was launched in uh, cop 20 Six in Glasgow. Um, I think uh, in the discussion or the organization who are um, uh, involved in this climate migration, we uh, we can we can start on with this policy, uh, the action plan. I uh, so far I know it was it started from last year that this should, there should be the action plan to implement that national strategy, and this national strategy I would say we which is quite comprehensive. E card and C three are all were there. And Ramu led that uh, uh, strategy, so which is can deal with the pre-displacement and post-displacement uh, aspect, and also look the displacement from a human rights aspect. Uh, and uh, it's quite vast, I would say. So if we uh, work with the government institutions and counterpart on implementation of the of that strategy, I think we 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 are in a very good place to start with. So uh, I I think I have taken my time. Uh, I I want to make it longer. Uh, thank but, you, Shireen. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Switzerland ha has played a role in uh, in the platform for disaster uh, displaced uh, disaster yeah, we, displaced we persons, and and it's been here. shared. And Bangladesh government has also changed. I have one question, which is uh, any one of the panelists, please pick it up. Uh, is it true that the climate change induced refugees, migrants are not covered by the 1951 convention relating to the refugees? Uh, uh, it, it, it is true, but uh, if yes, are there any space and scope of influencing so that the climate change induced refugees are eligible for protection under the convention. So, Manuel, I see your camera on. You want to take that? It, it is I, true. I, I 1951, can, can there was no conversation on climate change. Yeah. I can take you to the, the point to say, no, there will be no space because there is a fear and a legitimate fear, and IOM is one of the supporters of the non-inclusion, that that would dilute the concerns of protection that the framework has concerning strictly uh, refugees. Persons crossing uh, borders uh, for migration are a particular category. Um, they have to, we have to have a discussion on what they, what they constitute, but uh, we do not envision that there will be the space for that. The bulk of the displacement that is predicted in the majority of the literature is internal displacement. They configure IDPs, they will not configure refugees crossing uh, borders into other countries. There are areas where, of course, there's that permeability, but I don't think in the near future, and the many, and some attempts made on this conversation have been, uh, let's say, um, gently uh, signaled that this will not happen. There are great fears of what damage this can do to the convention and to this sacred- It has space. to be outside the present convention, maybe uh, the climate convention, UNFCCC. Okay, so I, I, we get, we get, we understand that. I think it's very, there, there is, you know, people that move borders, they are fleeing from danger or they have, they have an unlivable situation. And so we, between refugee convention and migration frameworks, have legal frameworks. Both of them need to be reinforced. Both of them need to be um, strengthened, implemented. But we don't think there is global need for another uh, classification and another category. I don't think it would actually be helpful. It will divert a lot of energy from the true nature of the problem we'll have in hands, which is this internal displacement that will be much easier, much faster happening and much rapid. Um, and, and that is a, a priority to all of us. Over. Sheila, uh, Shirin, you have your hand up. 
on uh, this point? Uh, just mm -hmm. one point I wanted to raise. Uh, wanted Is it to about, about this but, uh, convention? Yeah, it's about this, not about exactly the convention, but this uh, this status of refugee or talking about this inter uh, climate mm -hmm. migration at the global level. In the, during the last COP, as I think many of uh, uh, the participants who follow the COP, there's a very little, I mean, um, uh, from Bangladesh side, definitely there was, uh, this issue was raised, but unfortunately, I mean, as I had a strong interest, I was looking for more discussion on the climate uh, induced migrants and their status, but it didn't come come up that much. So that is something that I wanted to raise. And the other part, I think uh, Manuel has already mentioned, so I don't repeat that. Thank you. Thank you. So this question was raised by my colleague Jagat Patnaik, who's our Asia uh, Regional Head in Action Aid International. Uh, okay, so I want to go back. I, we won't have time for question and answers, but I want to give all the panelists one minute. And uh, so uh, Sanjay, what should be done in one minute? The magic- well, we, we heard many recommendations. Magic already. solution. Yeah. Well, I think one, uh, certainly we need to uh, frame uh, solutions on ground. Um, legalities will take its own time. International frameworks will take its own time. We heard from Manuel that how, you know, UNFCCC and um, other refugee frameworks, um, they need to work in tandem. Uh, but I think work on the ground and more important is adaptation is more and more must. Uh, we have, we in fact, within mobility, we also need to differentiate between planned migration and forced migration. Planned migration can be linked with adaptation. Uh, forced migration is basically, uh, you know, uh, distress migration, which needs immediate attention. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Sheila, one minute for you. I think, I think that we have to keep looking at population transitions and identify vulnerabilities and deal with it. There's always a conflict, like some of you have talked about, that in order to push everybody into one category, then everybody fails. But the reality is that for millenniums, people have kept moving and some movements are validated and celebrated and some are not. And we are looking at ways by which we can understand, support, assist, and facilitate those transitions so that their human rights are not affected, that they have a right to explore those options because this is going to grow, this is not going to go. And South Asia is the least urbanized part of the climb, you know, of the of the world. And we are completely inadequately uh, uh, capable of actually anticipating the different transitions. What's going to happen? Uh, our countries are not sitting together and understanding the implications of climate but also economic situations. And those lines are blurred. So the reality is a blurred blob and we have to keep digging into that information to aggregate different trends and address them. And I think that what you have started doing is a very important starting point for this. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. Zareen? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. What can we do or shall we, should we do? One minute. Okay. Have I lost? I think... One second. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, please go ahead. Oh, sorry, I, my headphones were disturbing. Okay, so um, have, I think um, we should focus more on this issue and, and the problem that we are now facing that there is not, not enough evidence-based research to support this uh, climate-induced displacement or migration, whatever we're saying. So I think we should focus more on uh, uh, research and evidence gen generation and especially include all the, all the stakeholders, especially I, I think youth can play a very good role in this, uh, in this area because I think young researchers now are very enthusiastic. I myself is from a different um, background. I'm not from climate change or environment related studies, but I, I found interested in this issue. So I think we can uh, in, uh, in, engage more youths and, and encourage them to take participate in, in this type of research and make them more aware of uh, this 
uh, and uh, I myself is uh, involved in uh, policy development and in policies, I think more young people should get involved because our insights are quite different than the uh, seniors. So uh, when more youths uh, take part, uh, I think uh, I, I, I get we, your we point. get dynamic uh, yeah. outcomes. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. you. Anandita? Yes, Appa. I think, Appa, it's uh, time for action. And those actions need to be uh, realistic, comprehensive, and human-centric because there is no time for error. And as you have already mentioned, that we all have to come together to find the solution. And we cannot just think about our future uh, because it's it's everyone's. So we have to, you know, let that go and come together and find the solution together. So yes, that's the only way out that I think is left for us. Sakib Nabi. How can the private sector make a contribution? Sakib, you have one minute. Sakib? Um, um. Yes, I would like to hear from you. I give you one minute. You raised the issue about how the private sector should be involved. So that is very important. Yeah, thank you for up. I mean, it's a pleasure to be a part of this discussion. The reason why we are very passionate about the role of private sector in addressing uh, internal displacement is that their clout is increasing in Bangladesh. We see a huge number of private sectors with the resources, with the right kind of orientation. The only thing they need at the moment is that they're, you know, they to understand how they can contribute to it. So we need more clarity on that. Upper. That's what I was wanting to put it over here. Thank you. Thank you, Sakib. So, you know, I uh, from the discussion, what I think uh, or feel that we all need to come together, first of all, to remember the vulnerability. There is a vulnerability issue of those who are migrating, are being displaced or are uh, forced, whether it is an informed decision or forced and stressed migration. The vulnerability is at the top. Secondly, we have to understand the fragility of this whole situation. You know, when you are uh, moving because of climate induced disasters, intense and repeated disasters, you're losing your land, you're losing your home, you're losing your livelihood, and uh, you don't have much options, you, you want to find options and you think that, okay, moving into this in, uh, slum or into the city. And we see that while there is the story of those who are displaced, there is the other story of those who exploit. So we have to understand that the, the, you know, the welcoming and not so welcoming, both uh, factors are there when people migrate. And there were some very interesting studies uh, presented uh, as part of the Gobeshana, you know, when they come to they migrate and they're in the informal settlement, the slum, the mental health issue, the security issue, the gender-based violence issue. So it isn't a very simple uh, matter for someone to make that decision. And often we have seen in the past, it's the men who first migrate and then they bring their family. But with the repeated uh, disasters and you know what salinity rising water level flooding water logging you the gap between uh, one disaster and others is really becoming shorter so it's the destination where it has to be planned and i think uh, sheila mentioned that none of the cities are really planning and uh, for instance dhaka city has at least 10 master plans and we still have to think about how to make the city more effective and welcoming and supportive. And uh, there are so many issues around that. So the city periphery and this planning, local government and the city government, as well as the national government need to work together. So I think we have for ourselves that are, though all those who are here have a lot cut out to do, whether we, we are trying to put this on the agenda uh, we want IOM and other UN agencies to keep putting this on the agenda. And we also want to make sure that we collect the evidence, we do the research. And when we talk about research, it needs investment. And where is this investment going to come from? So it's, it has to be from 
philanthropic and grants, but also the government. Because if the government is committed, then it will look for evidence to be able to make the plans. Therefore, the need for coherence, the need for coordinated approach, and it is not going to suffice to say, well, we didn't understand, or it's not, uh, this migration is not climate induced, or that migration is climate induced, but, and so on. It's not going to suffice. It calls for coordinated, plan, coherent thinking, planning, and investment. I'm, I uh, owe a huge thank you to all of you for being here. It was excellent to listen to all of you. I'm energized, rejuvenated. It's been a very long week, but you know, listening to all of you, I feel our collective energy will enable us to impact and influence. So stay with us and share with us whatever you're doing and let's join forces. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here.